Oh, hello, I'm Will, and welcome to Good Game Spawn Point. Today on the show, we boldly build where no one has built before in our review of Space Engineers. Plus, we lift with our knees and get packing in the couch co-op, couch moving chaos of moving out. <laughs> They say lift with your knees, but you've got to lift with your hands, right? Your knees can't pick up things unless they have thumbs. Maybe that could work. Oh, I've been in this room for far too long. Let's just start the show. When it comes to space games, I found there are two types. The ones that make you want to go to space and the ones that make you glad you have your feet firmly planted on planet Earth. Space Engineers manages to be both. Just so pretty, I wanted to see it. Keen Software House, Space Engineers first came out in 2013 for the PC, but as of this year has officially been ported over to the Xbox One for spawnlings to enjoy solo or with friends. There are a few different modes to choose from, the first on the list being First Jump. This acts as your most basic tutorial, taking you through movement, crafting and even a bit of vehicular combat wrapped up in an overarching story that sees you, a lowly engineer, recruited by rebels to bring down an evil corporation and uncover an ancient artefact. It was everything I wanted from a space game. Action, adventure, intrigue. I was having so much fun. And then, just as the story was amping up and I was fully invested, it ended on a cliffhanger. incredibly short experience but it definitely succeeded in getting me hooked and it's for that reason alone that I am not super mad at such a betrayal. Learning to survive looks at certain tasks you'll have to complete out on your own and how to handle them like making repairs to machinery, mining for resources and the importance of not drifting off into space just because you felt like it. Health critical. <laughs> Despite spending so much time in these tutorial modes and trying to soak up all that sweet, sweet know-how, Space Engineers was still very much a learn-as-you-go experience for me. And nowhere was that more apparent than in the survival mode. Here you're dropped onto a planet or out in space with nothing but a few tools, supplies and your wits to survive. The end goal is to make it to a far-off space station and defend it, but in my playthrough at least, well, I really hope they had a backup hero. If you've played games like Subnautica or Astroneer, you'll know that grinding makes up a good chunk of the experience, and that's no different here. Harvesting resources and crafting items to expand your base as the workload increases all take time. But the natural gameplay loop means that there's always something to be done while you wait, even if you aren't 100% sure what that something is, which for me was pretty often. <laughs> that confusion isn't helped by a rather cluttered control scheme. Obviously with a PC game, you've got loads more buttons to assign functions to, but on a controller, the options are far more limited and so there's a lot of overlap, which made navigating menus trickier, which in turn made for a very stop-start crafting experience. I also noticed some bugs here and there, like textures popping in and out, and at one point I was dropped 90 kilometers away from my first base after respawning and effectively had to start all over again. 
For those who aren't as keen on waiting around, there is a creative mode, which allows you to build just about anything you want. It was a really nice change of pace after spending so long grinding and rationing my resources in survival mode. To just be let loose on an unsuspecting galaxy, <laughs> no one was safe. There's also a community workshop that lets you explore other player-built creations and worlds for yourself. Not to mention the thousands of online tutorials made by fans and the devs themselves. I've said it once and I'll say it again, there is no shame in looking up a how-to. At the end of the day, Space Engineers requires a great deal of your patience and time to get through. While it never holds your hand or tries to micromanage you, the sheer amount of choice and the game's dedication to the players you want approach meant that I often felt lost and overwhelmed. In fact, if I hadn't been reviewing this, I'm not sure I would have stuck with it. But I'm really glad that I did. Sure, it's challenging, but the sense of accomplishment I felt from figuring out something I'd been stuck on or discovering a new location or resource was so satisfying, it made me want to keep playing. So I'm giving Space Engineers four out of five rubber chickens. Excellent! I've managed to fit my pasta scoops with special technology designed to scoop up all the very best gaming news! Oh. Welcome to the scoop! First up this week, and while Splatoon 2's Order and Chaos Splatfest last year was said to be the last one ever, a special bonus one-off Splatoon 2 Splatfest is happening at the end of May. It's set to revive 2017's condiment clash of mayonnaise and ketchup aka tomato sauce. The 2017 Worldwide Splashfest resulted in a win for Team Mayo. Will Ketchup get a fair shake of the sauce bottle and redeem itself this time around? We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Moving along now to some more news. And some international art museums are making parts of their collections available for Animal Crossing New Horizons. Players can browse the online collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Getty Museum, for example, and generate QR codes that can then be scanned and imported into the game using the Nintendo Switch online app. While you can save these works as designs, they can't be added to your in-game museum collection. But at least you know they're authentic. Unlike some of the works Jolly Red is selling. That wily fox. <laughs> In other news, New Zealander Scott McLaughlin recently won the virtual IndyCar iRacing Challenge finale. Oh, 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 yeah! We won! We won! <laughs> it was a surprising victory, with McLaughlin initially set to finish the race in fifth. But some last-minute crash chaos before the finish line allowed him to pull a Bradbury, as they say, speeding past his opponents to claim the win. They crash across the line. Scott McLaughlin's going to win. Ferrucci just took out Askew at the finish line. And McLaughlin was there to say thank you very much. Another story that's been in the news lately is that Minecraft has teamed up with the United Nations Development Program for a public health campaign. As part of this, a company called AKQA has created Blockdown Simulator, <laughs> a Minecraft map for Java Edition that aims to help illustrate why social distancing is needed during a pandemic. Minecraft's social media channels are also using well-known Minecraft mascots to promote safety measures, including tips about sanitizing keyboards and gaming gear. You know what they say, the cleaner the keyboard, the greater the gamer. Or is that just me? And now for the extra scoop! <laughs> And speaking of good hygiene practices, a Japanese orchestra has recorded a special 20-second performance of the Super Mario Overworld theme music to use as a guide for hand washing. And that's it for the scoop this week. Oh, I should come up with a clever signature sign-off, shouldn't I? Like a like a famous news presenter. Oh. <clears throat> Until next time, keep watching the game's news, Spawnlings. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's not quite right. I'll try another one next time.
You know those games that have weird titles that you just can't work out the meaning behind? Yeah, Moving Out's not one of those games. As a budding new furniture arrangement and relocation technician, that's fart, you'll be jumping in and helping a variety of citizens move out. To do so, you'll need to pick up, drag, and throw a set list of objects out onto the truck before the timer runs out. Throughout the game, you'll receive jobs from your cardboard box boss, which raises a lot of questions considering you'll be throwing cardboard boxes, but I'll leave that alone. It's a simple concept with a not-so-simple set of challenges to overcome. From something as easy as a specially marked box full of breakables that can't be thrown, so you'll need to track it safely all the way to the truck, to ghosts that'll knock you out, and chairs that will run away from you. There's always something new around the literal corner, and you'll get to discover it all alongside up to three friends. Seeing that sweeping opening shot of a level, with each item being pinged on screen, you and your removalist pal can hatch a plan of attack. Maybe we go for all the items that require two people to lift first, or just get all the small boxes out first. Making the plan is great, but watching it all fall apart in chaotic craziness is hilarious. And whilst there is the option to play solo, it's just tricky, but without the fun. You will be able to lug the big objects that would usually require two people, but it feels a whole lot more awkward. If you have an L-shaped couch, I am not helping you. Okay, uh, mm -mm, maybe over here? No, okay, oh. Mm. Ah. <laughs> All right, that's just stuck now. This game is certainly the case of the more, the frantically merrier. But the other half of the challenge is dealing with this game's insane physics. Your fart, that's furniture arrangement and relocation technician, is just a bundle of jelly stuffed in a toaster man body. So you'll be wobbling and bouncing all over the map. And whilst it's adorable, it makes precisely grabbing objects almost impossible. It often feels like it's the only thing preventing you from victory. It's very much a stylistic choice, but when that style is holding me back from having fun, it's a bad choice. The disorienting bounciness sometimes makes it hard to work out which way you're facing, too. So you and your partner will spend a good chunk of the time waggling your controllers trying to make sense of left and right. Look, you'll soon decide that getting silver is just as good as gold, and maybe bronze doesn't look so bad either. Even so, I was never put off going another round because there's just so much variety here. There's always something fun to surprise you, like this one specific house that had been hit with snow. Initially, this snow-covered slide seemed like an obstacle, but it quickly became the easiest path down to the truck. This happens constantly, with levels revealing their hidden secrets throughout your playtime. And the fun doesn't stop there. At the completion of each level, a new set of challenges will be revealed. Ranging from completing the level without breaking anything, to more cryptic objectives like who let the goose out. It's also pretty fun to try and beat the system when you first jump into a level. Just looking at that perfectly placed basketball hoop or obscure objects and thinking, is that a challenge? Do I need that flamingo? Is that flamingo required? Then you just chuck it in the truck and bam, you ticked off an objective before you even knew it existed. Ah, so satisfying. Plus, each challenge rewards you with a coin, earn enough of these, and you'll start unlocking games in the arcade. There's a whole variety of retro-style video games on offer, but these are hard. Like, really, really hard. I've not completed a single one of these so far, and I put that down to the far too floaty movement, which prevents almost any progress. <sighs> and once you fail these a few times, you'll probably not want to come back to them. Not to worry, though, the arcade is but the side dish to the already floppy, physics-defying chicken schnitzel that is moving out. Though I never really got a strong handle on the floaty controls, the simple concept of getting everything out of a house on time allows for such a playful variety of levels. Plus, the chaotic cooperation required to complete a level never ceases to disappoint. So I'm giving Moving Out 3.5 out of 5 rubber chickens. All right, it's Ask SP time. Let's see what kind of questions have hit the inbox this week. Will they be curly questions? Or perhaps just a little bit wavy? Well, there's only one way to find out, so let's jump right in with this video from 
Pikachu? Wow! I can't believe he watches the show. Hey, it's Pikachu here, and I have a few questions for you. But first, I need to show you something. Ooh, emoticons! Way! Oh. Now I'm done. So, uh, what is the most played Pokemon game? And second, what is the best Nintendo Switch game? Bye! Thanks, Pikachu. Your question about the most played Pokemon game sounds like one for Darren to me. So I'm just gonna get him on the line. Hello, this is Darren. Hi, Darren, it's Rad. Uh, I was hoping that you could help me with a little bit of data. Oh, affirmative. Data is my middle name. Uh, well, actually, it's part of my first name. <laughs> I, I thought the D and Darren stood for Darren. Anyway, um, what's the most played Pokemon game? Well, it can be hard to quantify the most played game, but we can see which Pokemon games have been the most popular according to sales. <laughs> uh, so not counting spin-offs or games like Pokemon Go. The original first-generation Pokemon games, which were known as Red and Green in Japan and Red and Blue in other parts of the world, are said to be the highest-selling Pokemon games. Pokemon Yellow is also usually counted with these, as it is a special edition, enhanced version of the Red and Blue games. Taken all together, these games have a combined total estimate of over 45 million copies sold! Not to mention all the additional players accessing the game through the virtual console after their original release. Whoa! Over 45 million? That's a lot of Pokemon. Affirmative. Of course, this is based on the best available sales figures for those games from the time, so there is some margin of error. Oh, I do hate it when data isn't definitive. If robots were in charge, that surely wouldn't occur. Uh, but I digress. Oh, and the latest main Pokemon games, Pokemon Sword and Shield, are also reported to have sold over 16 million copies worldwide in the first six weeks of their release, which is quite an achievement. Seems like even 24 years later, people love to catch them all. Well, thanks for your help, Darren. Bye! You're welcome. Bye-bye! <laughs> Now to your question about the best Switch game. Well, like we always say, there's not really any such thing as the one best game. It really depends on what you like to play. Games like Animal Crossing New Horizons, Super Mario Odyssey, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Luigi's Mansion 3, Pokemon Sword and Shield, and Splatoon 2 are all really good and worth looking at. Personally, I'm a huge fan of some of the indie titles available on Switch, like Untitled Goose Game or Bubba Is You for some very tricky puzzling. Or maybe the Steam World games, all of them are so good. Or Into the Breach and Wargroove if you're a strategy fan. Which I am, and I must say Wargroove is excellent. Now moving on to our next question, and this one comes from Queen N in Adelaide. Hi, GGSP. Can you please answer my two questions? One, is Talking Simulator on the Xbox 360? Two, is Procreate a game? If it is, can you get it on an Apple laptop? That's all for now. Love, Queen Nutrients. Thanks, Queen Nutrients. If you're wondering if Talking Simulator, which is actually called Speaking Simulator, is available on the Xbox 360, well, the answer is... Unfortunately, no. It's only available for PC and Switch at the moment. It may come to other consoles at some point, but I think it would be pretty unlikely to come to Xbox 360 in the future, considering that that is an older console, and developers usually focus on the current generation of consoles. Now to the question of whether Procreate is a game or not. Well, Procreate is actually an art and design app, rather than a game. It's more like a tool or program for creating graphics and artwork, similar to something like Microsoft Paint, but much more complex and professional. Now on to our next question, and it's a quick video from Tyler. Hi, GGSP. My name's Tyler, and I've uh, only got one question. Um, have you guys ever made a review on Journey? If not, can you please make one? Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Tyler. So, yes, Journey was reviewed on the show by Bajo and Darren back when it was released in 2012. You can take a look at it in our online archive to see what they thought. I also know Gem included Journey in her top five chill games. That video is also available for you to watch online. 
and you might even like some of the other games in her list if you enjoyed Journey. As for my thoughts on the game, well, I thought Journey was a beautiful and moving game experience. And that music, oh, it's just stunning. You can see and feel its influence on a lot of other games too, like Rhyme, Gree, Fae, and of course Abzu, which is from the same art director, or Sky, Children of the Light, which is from the same game studio. <sighs> journey really takes you on a journey. But that's all the time we have for our question journey for today. If you've got a question that you'd like us to answer, go here and send it in. Oh, and make it a video question to score some cool GGSP loot if we put it on the show. Now, would we consider those questions curly? They were certainly crimpy. Frizzy questions. Fizzy questions! Makes you think. Well, that's all the GGSP you get today, friends, but we'll be back. When we check out the remake of the beloved JRPG classic, Trials of Mana. We will find the stones. Plus, Darren takes us on a tour of the fancy new ray tracing graphics in Minecraft. And make sure you check out the ABC Me app for an extra delicious and nutritious snack-sized serve of GGSP, where Rad dishes up her review of Cooking Mama Cookstar. Speaking of delicious, I've got a fresh cheese toasty right here that isn't going to eat itself. So until next time, gem out. Oh, you made cheese toasties without me? Ooh, who's made cheese toasties? It's mine. Mine, you hear? Look how hungry!